and well, maybe this is a surprise. It is. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a surprise anymore. It's too bold of a statement. Okay. Uh, let's see some comments on the homework coming back. Uh, the homework as a group is looking much better than let's say homework one did. I think you're getting an idea of the sorts of things I'm looking for and that's good. Um, let's see, Devin, I'm going to steal your book here real quick. Um, in section nine, problems 10 through, let's see, da, 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 da. where am I here? Um, let me make sure I'm in the right problems. Hmm. Now I'm lost. I am lost. Uh, I'm in the wrong section here. Okay, bear with me here for a minute. There's a totally insightful comment I need to make. It's a question about the way they phrase the question. They want you to take a permutation and they want you to write it as a product of disjoint cycles and then figure out the order. Yeah, thank you. Okay. 13D. Thank you. Yeah, in section 9, 13D. Yeah, I was looking too quickly at the question here. So, uh, section 9. Problem 13D, the question was not simply find the order of each of the permutations in exercises 10 through 12. The question is find the order of each of the permutations given in those three exercises by looking at its decomposition into a product of disjoint cycles. And what some of you simply did was you took the given permutation and you wrote it as a product of disjoint cycles, then completely forgot about the fact that you wrote it as a product of disjoint cycles, and then just started pounding out the order. And the point of that question was to sort of give you the type of computation that we did in class, which was if you write things as products of disjoint cycles, like something like, I don't know, 1, 2, 5, and then 3, 4, or something like that, if you want the order of this thing, if you're going to start raising it to powers, like squared, is, well, the point is what? Well, yeah, you could write this thing out in longhand and then just start pounding it out. But the point is, because these are disjoint, they commute. So typically this should just be if we're in a general group. So there it is, and here I do it again. But the point is, because these are disjoint, these commute. So this is 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 5, 3, 4, 3, 4. And what you learned in a previous piece of this exercise is that that's E. So this is just 1, 2, 5 squared and then continue to go. And what you're being led to is the result in part E, which says that if you have a transposition written as a product of disjoint cycles, then the order of this thing is going to be the least common multiple of the length. But if you didn't do a computation like this on part uh, on question 13E, if you just started pounding out uh, lengths or orders of permutations without doing a computation like this, then you sort of miss the point of that particular problem. So I nicked you a little bit on that. And, ah, yeah. On the extra problem, I saw some less than optimal notation being used. What you have to distinguish between is the apples and the oranges here. The apples are the underlying elements of the set. Maybe the numbers one through five. The oranges, the things that you're interested in, are the elements of S5, are permutations. 
So there are functions, those are the things that are of interest, those are the things that we're composing, those are the elements of the group, and the description of those functions has to do with what they do on the domain, in this particular case, one, two, three, four, five. And so, for example, I saw things like in the extra problem, um, well, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to write this down because I might see it kicked back and I don't want to see it kicked back. So I'll write it in a different color. Something like in part two, take the identity element. So E of three equals three. Yeah, it does. And you've justified why that's true. And then what some of you said, E and H. And that's, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard. It's apples and oranges. Three is something in the underlying set. It's a number from one to five. The things in H are functions. So this completely makes no sense. If you want to write this, therefore E is in H, not 3 or E of 3 is in H. E itself is in H. That's the good notation. Okay. So in the other parts, too, the same sort of thing happened. You might say sigma circle tau of 3 equals 3. Therefore, sigma circle tau of 3 is in H. It's not sigma circle tau of 3 that's in H. It's the composition of the two functions, sigma circle tau that's in H, so please be careful on that. Okay. All right, those were the only two commentable details that came up in the assignment from tonight, so that was good. All right, let's see, uh, as I mentioned in the email that I sent out on Friday, I put the solutions to this stuff on the web. If you want to download those, and I think we're good to go for Wednesday then. Okay. All right, I also will, I, I have a few extra tonight. If you want another blank copy of the practice exam or you, if you've lost uh, your copy of the info about the exam or something like that, you can come up and grab some after class. That will be no problem. So uh, at the end of last Wednesday, we got to this really important punchline. Let me remind you of what it said. So uh, recap. Uh, we're going to start with G, uh, any finite group. Finite means it has finitely many elements in it. Oh, here was something that actually came up in a question uh, during office hours today. This word, order, is a, a somewhat unfortunate one because it's used for two related but technically distinct things. The order of a group G is just the number of elements in G. So if we talk about the order of a group, it would have been nicer or clearer for students if we'd simply call it the number of elements in the group. But we don't. We call it the order of the group. If we talk about the order of an element, let's call it little g, in a group, capital G, then what we're talking about is what? Is the smallest positive integer with the property that blah, 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 smallest. And I won't write it out because you have the definition of the order of an element. So. Technically, this word order applies to two different things. Obviously, the two are related if the group happens to be a cyclic group. And if you happen to have handed me a generator for that cyclic group, then the order of the element, in other words, the order of the generator, is the order of the group that it generates. So the two words make sense when they do overlap, but we use the two words even in the situation where they don't overlap, order meaning either for a set, tell me how many elements in it, or order for an element meaning tell me the smallest positive integer for which you get the identity. So, so I'm going to say let G be any finite group, meaning the order of G is finite. But again, I'll just I'll try to use the non-order notation here. Uh, H any subgroup of G, then here's what. Lagrange's theorem said, Lagrange's theorem, at least part two, second part, that's the one we're going to focus on for now, says this, that the index of H in G, 
And I'll remind you what this notation stands for. The index of H in G, which is by definition the number of distinct, in other words, different, left cosets of H in G, whatever that number is, multiplied by the well, the order of H, or the number of elements in H, is the number of elements in G. The first part said if you hand me any two left cosets of H that necessarily they have the same number of elements in them, and that number of elements happens to be the number of elements in H. All right, we didn't technically prove all the details of this, but I showed you by means of an example and by showing that two left cosets are either disjoint or identical that we get this result and it is incredibly powerful this is powerful and Fraley the author here makes a statement which essentially says anytime you have a result that allows you to count something it's going to be important and this result allows you to count something it tells you for instance well it tells you how many cosets there are number of elements in G divided by the number of elements in H. It tells you, for instance, how many elements are in the subgroup. Figure out what the index is. Or it tells you how many elements in the group. If you know what the number of elements in the subgroup is and you know how many distinct left cosets there are. There are many more reasons why this is powerful. There are many really nice, important consequences of this result of this equation. Let me give you the first one. For example, if uh, H is a subgroup of G, and throughout this discussion today, folks, we're going to always assume that G is a group that has finitely many elements in it. We can talk about cosets for infinite groups, so we'll do that in a little bit, but at least as far as Lagrange's theorem goes, when you're trying to count something, yeah, I mean, it turns out there's an arithmetic of infinite sets, but we're not going to get to that this semester. That's sort of a first year graduate course idea. But the punchline is this. If you take a subgroup of a finite group, then the number of elements in the subgroup is a divisor of the number of elements in G. So if you have a subgroup, then the number of elements in it necessarily divides evenly, although I hate that phrase, is a divisor of however many elements are in the group. Rephrased sort of as a contrapositive, if uh, S is a subset of G and the number of elements in the subset is not a divisor of the number of elements in G, then the subset is not a subgroup. For example, Let's look at G is D4. Then G contains no subgroups having, for example, three elements. Because 3 doesn't divide the number of elements in G, which happens to be 8 here. G contains no subgroups having 5 elements, or 6 elements, or 7 elements. I mean, obviously it has no subgroups containing 9 elements because it has no subsets containing 9 elements because the set already has 8 elements in itself, hmm, etc. This is incredibly powerful. If you're looking for subgroups, don't bother looking at subsets having three elements, or five elements, or six elements, or seven elements, because those numbers don't divide. Now, you've got to be a little bit careful to not 
you know, conclude too much from this result. If I hand you a subset of this group, and let's say it happens to have four elements in it, then at least that subset is a candidate to be a subgroup. It doesn't automatically make it a subgroup. I can write down four, I'll say random elements sitting inside D4. Okay, at least as far as Lagrange's theorem goes, that set could be a subgroup, but hey, there are other things that might preclude it from being a subgroup, like it might not contain the identity element or something. So don't go too far. Uh, one very interesting question that we will take up in about three weeks or so is this. Okay, give me a group, D4, give me a number that could be the number of elements in a subgroup. Like you, if you give me D4, then it's got eight elements. If you then give me the number four, at least there could be a four element subgroup, because four divides eight. Is there a four element subgroup? It turns out the answer is yes, and we've seen one. The, the group consisting of row zero, row one, row two, and row three is a subgroup. So inside my eight element group, there is a subgroup of order four. There are many subgroups of order two that we've seen. There's obviously a subgroup of order one, Every group contains the subgroup just consisting of the identity element. Hmm. So an interesting question, this is sort of how the, I don't know, I, I guess the way a mathematician would think is, you have now this very powerful theorem, is there some sort of converse to it? If you have a subgroup, then the number of elements in the subgroup divides the number of elements in the group. Here's sort of the converse. If you have a group and you have a number that does divide the number of elements in the group, is there a subgroup having that many elements? And in this example, the answer is yes. And in general, it turns out the answer is no. You can have a group, for example, there's a group with 60 elements that doesn't have any subgroups having 30 elements. So, you know, as powerful as this result is, it's not the end-all, be-all. It simply gives a lot of nice information. Hmm. Here's another example. What's the example? Uh, yeah, let the number of elements in G, so I'm going to give you some indication of how many elements are in the group I'm interested in. I'm going to call that number N. I don't care if the number is 8 or 100. It makes no difference to me. Let uh, G be an element of the group. Let, let's call it M, be the order of G. Remember, this is the notation for order. I know what order is. It's the smallest positive integer. Da -da 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 right? It's the smallest positive integer with the property that when you take g and you raise it to that power, you get the identity. Here's the punchline. Then this number is a divisor of m. I'm sorry, of n. Let me rephrase that in longhand. Rephrased, i.e., the order of g. And this is the notation, folks, for is a divisor of, means properly divides without remainder the number of elements in G. I try to avoid this notation because there's too many straight lines and too many squiggles. And, but that's the way you'd probably see this phrased in a textbook. A straight line means is a, is a, a divisor of. So, for example, before I go ahead and prove this, for example, if you're sitting back inside this group and someone hands you an element, and ask what's its order, in other words, what's the smallest positive integer so that when you raise this thing to the power you see the identity. Folks, the only possible answers are divisors of the number of elements in the group, are divisors of eight. So if you try to claim for me that you've written down an element inside D4 that has order six, I don't even have to check your arithmetic. I know that it can't be the case because this says that the order of each element has to divide the number of elements in the group. And the proof is easy. Proof? Well, let's see. Hmm, this is powerful. This first consequence says if you have a subgroup, then the number of elements in the subgroup is always a divisor of the number of elements in the group. But wait a minute, so is the order of G. The order of G, whatever that number is, is the number of elements in this subgroup. We proved that, I don't know, two weeks ago or so. If you want to know how many are... Yeah, Elements are in the cyclic subgroup generated by G. It's precisely the number of times you have to take in order for G to get back to the identity. Previous result. 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 My handwriting's going south here, sorry. 
previous result. Oh, now use consequence one. The order, oh, is the order of that subgroup. And if you have any subgroup, then the number of elements in the subgroup is the divisor of the number of elements in the group. All right, questions there, comments? So that's pretty powerful. And the final consequence of Lagrange's theorem that I want to share with you here is, I mean, is one that to me is truly unbelievable. Look, the definition of a group is simply you have a binary operation that's associative, there's an identity element, and each element has an inverse. There's absolutely nothing in the definition of a group that says anything about numerical information. It's also the case, folks, that there are very few cyclic groups. I mean, we know what they look like. It's Z sub n for your favorite n. Z2, Z3, Z4, etc. Those are all the cyclic groups. So those are somehow the, the, the easiest groups to understand. Here's the third consequence. Consequence of Lagrange's theorem. Let's see, did I number these? Here's the first consequence. Oh, this is the second consequence. Sorry. And here's the third consequence, consequence three. If P is a prime number, is prime, and the number of elements in G is P, then G is cyclic. Folks, if I hand you a group with seven elements, it's cyclic. I mean, where does that come from? That's, in, that's truly unbelievable. If I hand you a group with 11 elements, it's necessarily cyclic. Why? Because the number of elements in the group is a prime number. Reason, proof. All right. Well, prime number is necessarily bigger than or equal to 2 by definition. So I've handed you a group with at least two elements in it. And I always know what one of the elements in a group is, the identity. So here's all I want you to do. Grab any element in the group that's not the identity element. There's a lot of them. In fact, all but one of them is. So pick any element, let's call it little g in capital G, with g not equal to e. You have plenty of choices. Then here's the subgroup. Look at this subgroup. The subgroup generated by G, the cyclic subgroup generated by G. Hmm. All right, I'm going to tell you a couple things about it. So the first thing is, it's a subgroup of G. That's no big deal. I haven't used anything about the hypothesis yet. In any group, if you take any element in any group and you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by it, you get a subgroup. Okay, that's pretty good. The first thing is, the number of elements in this cyclic subgroup well, I've asked you to take not the identity. So when you look at cyclic subgroup generated by, by definition, what do you do? You write down the identity, and then you write down G. So I've already written down two elements in there. So there's at least two things in there. I'll put in parentheses because I've asked you to start with not the identity. But let's see. Oh, the number of elements in that cyclic subgroup divides the number of elements in the group by Lagrange's theorem. It's a subgroup. So if I tell you how many elements are in it, I don't know that number yet, but I represent that by number of elements in G, then necessarily that number. That was Lagrange, or if you want consequence one of Lagrange's theorem. I look on just theorem consequence one. So, but wait a minute, what's the hypothesis? But number of elements in G is prime. That's the hypothesis. So I've now written down a number, that number, whatever it is, that divides a prime number. And I haven't written down the number one. I've written down some. Oh, so what's the conclusion? That this thing is the prime number. I have a 
divisor of a prime that's not one, and the only divisor of a prime is the prime number itself. In other words, is the number of elements in the group. So here's the conclusion now. I have a subgroup is a subgroup of G having the same number of elements as G. Elements as G as G. So I have a subset of a finite set and the subset has the same number of elements as the set. So the conclusion is that, in fact, the subset is the set. So the conclusion that we're able to draw, folks, is a numerical one. That the number of elements in the subset is equal to the number of elements in the set. And it's from that piece of information that we can conclude just by set results, discrete math stuff, math 215, if you have a subset of a set, and the subset and the set have the same number of elements, then necessarily the subset has to be the entire set. In other words, G is a generator for G. G generates capital G, and we're done. Done. So that's incredibly powerful. So if somebody says, I'm thinking of a group of 13 elements, in effect, you already know what the group is. It's a cyclic group. And hey, there's only one cyclic group. It's Z13, up to isomorphism. Questions, comments? Grange's theorem is incredibly powerful. And again, I'll, this is like the third time I mentioned this. And, I don't know, totally surprising. Totally surprising. Just given the definition of a group, you're impressed, hopefully, that there is all this numerical data that somehow corresponds to it. All right. Questions, Eric? Comments? Well, before we move on, I want to spend, I don't know, five to ten minutes talking about, well, an idea that you would expect, given what we've been talking about for the last lecture and a half, we've been talking about left cosets of a subgroup inside a group, and the question is, what's so special about left cosets? Well, if there's left cosets, there probably should be right cosets, and there are, and so let me spend a few minutes talking about right cosets. So, up until now, we have focused focused on what are called left cosets of a subgroup of a subgroup inside a group. In a group, it turns out, not surprisingly, we can also construct, build what are called the right cosets. Cosets of H in G. I'll tell you how to do it. Well, let's see. What were the left cosets? The left cosets, just as a reminder. No, I don't want to write it down. because Well, yeah, left coset. I will. That's all right. Um, looks like uh, AH. AH yeah? equals all the things that you can write in the form little a times h, where h is in the subgroup. Here's what a right coset is. The right coset, coset of uh, h generated by a is simply the set h a. Did I get that backwards? No, I think I'm all right. It's the set of things in the group that you get by putting the element in question, the thing called the lay on the right, and multiplying it by all the elements in the subgroup. In effect, everything that we did when we built left cosets can be mimicked for right cosets. There is an equivalence relation on the group. Definition of the equivalence relation is you deem A to be related to B in case A, B inverse is in the subgroup, rather than deeming A to be related to B by putting A inverse B in the subgroup. You then get these things called right cosets. Any two right cosets are either disjoint or equal. And there's a Lagrange's theorem for right cosets. 
Rogers theorem says the number of right cosets, in other words, the right index, times the number of elements in the subgroup is the number of elements in the group. So it turns out there is a lot of similarity between what happens with the left cosets and the right cosets. But the similarity is really only numerical sim similarity. In general, here's what turns out to be a little bit confusing but true. It turns out that numerically, numerically, the left and right cosets share many properties. For example, e.g., first, the number of elements of elements in any right coset equals the number of elements in any left coset. So somebody sits down and pounds out a right coset, somebody else sits down and pounds out a left coset, it turns out the number of elements that each person will be looking at is the same. And in fact, both of these numbers simply equal the number of elements in the subgroup. And you see, if I write down the subgroup itself, there's no mention of left or right. There simply is. And I'll write it this way. There's sort of a Lagrange's theorem theorem for right cosets. And let's see, what does Lagrange's theorem say? The number of left cosets times the number of elements in the subgroup is the number of elements in the group. Lagrange's theorem phrased in terms of right cosets is the number of right cosets times the number of elements in the subgroup is... So folks, the number of left cosets equals the number of right cosets. The number of, of right cosets of H in G equals the number of left cosets of H in G. So when we talk about this thing that we call the index of a subgroup, technically I define the index to be the number of left cosets of the subgroup in the group. So I probably should have called that the left index or something like that. But the point is, if you want to know how many right cosets there are, it's the same as the number of left cosets. So instead of calling one the right index and the other the left index, we simply use the single word index. It's the index of the subgroup. But then you're asking, well, okay, so the number of elements in left cosets the same as the number of elements in right cosets, and the number of left cosets is the, so are they the same? And the answer turns out to be no, but here's the caveat, and we're going to spend at least three chapters talking about this particular observation. In general, uh, the left and right cosets of a subgroup might not be the same. I say, wait a minute, you just told me they are the same. No, no, no. What I've told you folks is that the number of elements in a left coset is the same as the number of elements in a right coset. And the number of left cosets is the same as the number of right cosets. So that's what I mean by numerically. There's a lot of interaction or over, overlap. but at the set level, if somebody hands you a left coset and says, is this also a right coset? The answer sometimes is yes, but sometimes is no. And the example to look at, example, eh, uh, no, I'll say we will see this later. We'll look at this further detail, detail, much later, but, oh, much later, in maybe two weeks or so, but I wanted to bring it up at this stage 
just because one of the homework problems asks you to show that so in certain situations some situations we can show that this left coset equals this right coset. Not always, but in some situations. And there is one such situation where you ask to show that this equals this in one of the homework problems. I think it's, I forget which number it was, 28 or 40, I forget. But anyway, it's one where I gave you the hint. And the hint was, the goal is to show that this left coset equals that right coset. And the way to do that is to show that one side is contained in the other. So the point is, showing that this left coset equals this right coset can't be done in general. Because in general, left cosets might not be the same as right cosets. But the punchline is, if you have some additional information about the subgroup, then you might be able to show that this equals this. And that's what you have to do in one of the homework problems. So that just gives some sort of context to that particular problem, that what you're proving for that particular subgroup sitting inside that particular group holds in that case, but definitely does not hold for all possible subgroups of all possible groups. All right. Questions? OK. So what we're going to do here is another change in topic. What we've done up until now, once we got past the general notion of a binary operation and we got into the, the specific discussion of groups was, all right, we, we've had sort of two methods that we've looked at of building groups. One is sort of the from scratch method. Look at this set. Look at this binary operation. Go through all of the computations to convince me that that set together with the binary operation is a group. You convince me it's a legit binary operation, you know, at least pay some lip service to making sure it's associative. Convince me that an identity exists. Convince me that for each element an inverse exists, etc. Groups from scratch. We did that a lot right at the beginning of our discussion of groups. And then we did it again when we built these permutation groups, when we built the SN groups. All right, we sort of built them from scratch. The other sort of point of view that we've taken is once you've got something that you've worked hard to show me as a group from scratch, then we can look inside those groups to find other groups. And presumably, those other groups are a little bit easier to verify because to show that something sitting inside a known group is also a group, you just got to show by the subgroup there. And show it's, you don't have to worry about existence of this or anything like that. Just show it's closed, show the identities in there. What we're about to do now is play another sort of game. And the game, I guess, can be viewed as how do you take things that are known to be groups and build new groups from them? And we've done that in some sense already, just by you take something that's known to be a group, look inside it, and see whether or not there are other groups living inside. Okay? Here we're going to take things that are known groups and find new groups, not by looking inside, but somehow piecing them together. And in effect, this process is really nothing more than a set process. Back in the discrete math course, you talked about taking two sets and forming their Cartesian product or their direct product. It's simply the ordered pairs where you take the first coordinates coming from the first set and the second coordinates coming from the second set. I mean, it's something you're totally familiar with. When you do R cross R, Cartesian product with R, you get R2, which is just, you know, you're taking ordered pairs of real numbers, and that's something you're familiar with. It's just the plane, or R3 is something you're familiar with. Well, we can talk about doing that for all possible sets, just ordered pairs, and what we're about to see, it's pretty easy to see, well, it will be pretty easy to see that in the end, if you take two sets that happen to be groups, and you simply hammer them together in a Cartesian product, then the result's going to give you a group. And so this is going to be another way of building new groups from known groups. And we'll see many more ways over the course of the, at least the first 10 weeks of the semester. So new subject, uh, this is called direct products of groups. The idea is, if we start with two or more groups, two or more, 
and we'll see how to do more in a minute. Groups. We can form the direct product of the sets, direct product of these things, as sets. And it turns out the resulting set result will be a group. Direct product. So remember what this looks like. So uh, specifically, let's just do it with two of them. If I hand you two groups, let's call them G1 and G2. And you know what? Let me be even more specific. Start with, well, I'm going to ask you to start with two groups. So one of them I'll call G1. G1 will have its own binary operation. Well, just to distinguish it from the binary operation that might somehow be defined on the second group, I'll call it star sub 1 and star sub 2. This might be S5 together with composition. This might be Z6 together with addition mod 6. I don't really care. The two operations in the underlying groups that are going on might be completely different. Of course, it might be the same group or in the same operation. I haven't precluded that possibility. But just start with two groups, and here's what you do. You form the set G1 cross G2. So what does this consist of? It consists of things that look like ordered pairs, little g1, little g2, with the property that little g1 is in capital G1, and little g2 is in capital G2. So that's all we're doing here. Well, it's just some math 215. It's just some basic set theory. Form the Cartesian product of the two underlying sets. Now what I have to do is teach you how to make this set into a group with some binary operation. It's pretty easy to do. Now, define a binary operation. A binary operation on this set, G1 cross G2. And it's pretty easy to do. Let's see. So what might it look like? Take something in G1 cross G2. What does it look like? It looks like an ordered pair. And folks, the things in this set, by definition, include the parentheses and include the comments. Just pairs of things where the first thing is from the first set, second thing is from the second set. Now I need to teach you how to combine that with something else in this set. Well, what does something in that set look like? It looks like something in the first group, but I've already called this thing G1, so how about let's call it G1 prime, G2 slash, or G2 hat, or G2 something. And I have to teach you how to combine these. Well, there's sort of an obvious way to do it. In the first coordinate, simply produce G1 star G1 prime. It makes sense to take G1 and combine it with G1 prime because both of those things live in this particular set. And this operation called star 1 is a binary operation in that set. And then G2, G2 prime. Hmm. In other words, I mean, the phrase would be just do things coordinate wise. Fine. Then the punchline is then. Proposition, proposition, this gives a group structure. G1 star G2 with this, I'm sorry, cross G2 with this binary operation is a group. I won't prove it in gory detail, but in some sense, folks, what we've done is we've produced a new group. Now, this isn't a subgroup of a known group, so technically, to convince you that this is a group, I have to go through the, the, you know, the gorier details of, I have to convince you first it's a binary operation. Yeah, it's a binary operation. That's no big deal. If you take any two things in this set, and the things in this set are inherently ordered pairs, here are two things in that set. You always get something well defined back in the set, yeah, because well we're using some you know properties of the binary operation already. We know that if we take two things in the first group and compute their star, whatever that is, we get something back in the first group, and we know that this is back in the second group. So at least we have a chance of 
writing down a binary operation, that's good. Is it associative? Well, that's sort of painful, but it is. What does that mean? You've got to take three things in the underlying set and convince me that if you combine them in this order and then do that one, that you'd get the same thing if you had switched the brackets. Well, look, folks, in the first case, what are you going to get? You're going to get G1, G1 prime star, G1 double prime. That's what we get in the first slot. In the second slot, you... Yeah, but wait a minute. Each of these two things individually is a group, so you can slide them over individually in each coordinate, and then you want to... Things are good. Third thing, we have to show that an identity exists. I mean, we're back to basics here, folks. Can you <laughs> identify the element in here that you think might be the identity element? Sure. Just, you know, take the identity element of the first group and the identity element of the second group, put them in the same ordered pair, and that should give you the identity element of this new group, and it does. I mean, there's something to show, but it's not too hard to do. Final question is, let's see, if I hand you an, an element in here, is there something that behaves as its inverse? In other words, is there something in here that you can write down so that when you combine the two things, using that definition of a binary operation, that you get the identity? Sure. If I hand you something in here, it means I've handed you something in the first group and something in the second group. You want the inverse of that thing? Sure, just write down the inverse of that one and the inverse of that one. It works. So this thing, G1, G2 inverse, turns out to be G1 inverse comma G2 inverse. So it turns out, turns out that the identity element is that and the inverse. Hmm. So again, I, I think our, I, mean, I could spend 15 minutes running through all the gory details, but I think our time is better spent just saying, yeah exactly where you'd expect to look for the identity element in the direct product and exactly where you expect to look for inverses is exactly where we should be. So let's just do a quick example. Example, here's a group. The first group is, I'm just going to make this up, D4. The second one is Z6 and I've just built a group. Now I haven't carried along the standard notation that we used when we were writing down technically the definition of the product of the two groups, the direct product or Cartesian product of the two groups, but we know what the operation is in D4, it's composition, and we know what the operation is in Z6. It's so this is a group. Uh, I don't know, here's an element. Here's the identity element. E is this thing. It's, you put the identity of D4 in. We would call that, we call it that. And you put the identity of Z6 in. So there's the identity element of the group. You just put the identity element of that one. Notice here, folks, it makes no sense to talk about switching these things around. For example, the, the pair 0, comma, row 0 is a complete non-issue. That makes no sense here because it's always the case that the thing you write down the first coordinate has to be in D4 and the second thing has to be in Z6. Well, let's do another example. Maybe something like if I give you row 1, comma, uh, 4, and I ask you for the inverse of that. Well, the inverse of an element in the product is you simply take the inverse of each one individually for inverse, and of course you've got to interpret this in the context of the group that it lives in. It turns out the inverse of row 1 is row 3 because row 1 circle row 3 is the identity. The quote-unquote inverse of 4 in here, it's the thing that you have to add to 4 to get 0, which is 2, because 4 plus 2 is 0. So there's the inverse of that thing. Let's do one more quick computation. If I ask you to compute, you know, row one, comma, three, star with, I don't know, mu one, comma, five. Let's see what we get. Well, the definition, folks, of combining two things is you get row one, mu one, comma, 3 plus 5 is 8, but we're doing arithmetic mod 6, so we get 2. And row 1, mu 1 turns out to be what? Somebody have their table out? Say it again. D1, delta 1. Okay, thank you. Delta 1, comma. So working in these things, you know, doing computations in these direct product groups is actually pretty easy. Now the definition I gave you was the definition that you use if you're only asked to take two groups and form their product. 
there's absolutely nothing special about just taking two groups. We can do the same thing, do the same product process, process with more than two groups. That's no big deal. And two groups. You know, I won't write down all the details, but it's the same idea. If somebody hands you seven groups, it makes sense to form their Cartesian product G1 cross G2 cross da da da, da cross G sub 7. That's a complete non-issue as sets, but then it turns out that that has a group structure. You just look at the, I mean, the philosophy is you just do everything coordinate-wise and things work out just fine. Okay, questions, comments so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what we're going to focus on. Let's see if that's all I need to say about products in general. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's do it this way. The the philosophy is this process of taking the direct product of two or more groups to produce new groups is somehow viewed as a straightforward sort of building block process that allows you to take things that you already know about and somehow extend them to other things. Like we knew about the group D4 before tonight, we knew about the group Z6 before tonight, but until tonight we didn't have information about this new sort of group, this D4 cross Z6 group, even though we know each of the pieces individually. And the question will be, all right, here's this new group. Can you say something about the new group? in terms of what you might already know about each of the pieces that make it up. So the goal is, goal, uh, say something about the properties of, properties of G1 cross G2, and I'll do the more general situation where you're taking more than two groups and forming their direct product, maybe up through G sub T, uh, in terms of, or as related to, the properties of each of the groups that make it up, of individual groups, individual groups, G1, G2, up through GT individually. Let me give you an example. For example, what's the order of this group? How many elements in it? That turns out to be easy because it has nothing to do with group theory. It's simply a fact about sets. If you hand me two sets and you form their Cartesian product, the number of elements in the Cartesian product is simply the the product of, you multiply the number of elements in each of the underlying sets. So for example, the number of elements in that group D4 cross Z6 is, well the number of elements in D4 is 8 and the number of elements in Z6 is 6, so 6 times 8 is 48. I've built a group with 48 elements in it. Example, uh, first, the number of elements in the direct product is you just multiply these numbers together. G1 times G2 and the times here is as whole numbers times G sub T. So there's an example. I can say something about the number of elements in this group by saying something about the number or the property of each of the individual groups that make it up. I can tell you how many elements there are. So for example e.g. the number of elements in this group that we looked at briefly, Z4 cross, I'm sorry, D4 cross Z6 is the number of elements in D4 times the number of elements in Z6, which is 8 times 6, which is 48. 
So there's sort of a brief glimpse as to the sort of flavor of questions we can ask. Here's another one that's more interesting. Suppose I hand you two groups and each of them is, let's see, what other properties have we studied? How about abelian? If I hand you two groups or three groups or some number of groups and each one individually is abelian, is the product still abelian? Well, that's a fairly interesting question. Turns out the answer to that one is yes. If I hand you a bunch of groups and they're each cyclic, is it the case that the direct product is cyclic? It turns out to be true sometimes, but not always. And we'll focus for the last 15 minutes tonight on that question. But there's other questions we can ask. That, you know, if I hand you some non-abelian groups and I form the direct product, is the, is the uh, corresponding group or the subsequent group still non-abelian? So example two, uh, if each G1 G2 up through G sub T is abelian, then it turns out then so is the direct product G1 cross G2 G sub T. That works out nicely. It's pretty easy to show just because when you do the binary operation in the product, it means that you're simply combining each corresponding term with the next one, so you have all these products here. But if each one of the individual groups is abelian, it means you can switch to this product, and you switch to this product, and you switch to this product, and in the end you've simply switched the whole thing around. So that's no big deal. But it turns out, this turns out to be the interesting question. Question, no, but it turns out in general, only sometimes. Is it the case that if G1 and G2 are cyclic, then G1 cross G2 is also cyclic? And I say, wait a minute, every cyclic group is abelian, yet you prove that for quiz two. So if I hand you two cyclic groups, and I've certainly handed you two abelian groups. That's no big deal. And let's see, this property two says because each of these is abelian, then at least this thing is abelian. But the question is whether or not it's cyclic. And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Let's go ahead and look at two particular examples. And then we'll try to make some general conjectures based on the two examples as to when it's the case that if you start with two or more cyclic groups and you form their direct product, the result is again cyclic. So example, let's look at this direct product of, and again, I'm only taking two groups here just because the idea is only a half hour old and I want to show you a lot of sort of small examples before we look at bigger issues. So here's Z2 cross Z3. So what do the elements look like? Well, let's List them out. Heck, Z2 only has two elements, 0 and 1, and Z3 only has three elements, so the product has only six elements. So, you know, this is small enough that we can actually list out things explicitly. So, one of them looks like 0, 0, and then what? How about 0, 1, and 0, 2, and 1, 0, and 1, 1, and 1, 2. There they are. There's the six elements. I'll list them out in some sort of systematic order. It doesn't matter what system you use. What I did, of course, was I listed all the elements of, uh, I listed the first element in Z2 and paired it with each of the elements in Z3. And then I, heck, if you wanted to have listed uh, the, the elements in Z3 first or something, it doesn't matter. So there they are. Now look at the following. Look. Look. If I take this particular element, And I look at the subgroup that it generates. Well, folks, all this stuff is the same. It's just the group that we're considering now happens to be that one. And the element that we happen to start with is that. Let's see what we get. Well, we get the identity element, because we always throw the identity element in for free. And there is the identity element. There's E. Why? Because it's paired 
the two identity elements, the two underlying groups, and then you put the element in. Okay, now let's see, what's 1, 1, I guess we'll use star notation here, 1, 1. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take the thing in the first coordinates and combine them. Of course, the operation in the first coordinate is addition mod 2. And then what you're supposed to do is take the two things in the second coordinate and combine them. Of course, the operation in the second coordinate is mod 3 arithmetic. So what do we get? Well, here we get 1 plus 1 in the first coordinate, which in Z2 is 0, because we're in Z2. 1 plus 1 in Z3 is 2. So that's what we've just gotten. So what we've just shown is that if we take this thing and we combine it with itself, we get that guy. Now let's do it three times. One, 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 one. In other words, do the binary operation on this element with itself three times. Well, we know how to compute these sorts of things because we've got some practice with it. Just, you know, don't reinvent the wheel each time. There's one, one, star, one, one. And I've already computed that from what we just did. Right, now I know how to do this. That's then 0 plus 1 in the first coordinate and 2 plus 1 in the second coordinate. And what does the result of that computation give in the context of Z2 cross Z3? Let's see, the first coordinate is 1 and the second coordinate is 0. Exactly right, because the computation in the second coordinate is happening inside Z3. Did we get the identity yet? No. Nope. Keep going. Let's do it four times. You know, one, one. Well, let's use that notation. It's one, one, star, one, one, star, one, one, star, one, one. And heck, I know how to do that. We'll do it by taking one, one, three times. That's what we already got. And doing it one more time. And we get what? Well, we get one plus one in the first coordinate. And we get 0 plus 1 in the second coordinate. And 1 plus 1 in the first coordinate is 0. And zero more, okay, so we still haven't seen the identity element yet. And how about, let's see, 1, 1 is 0, 1, star 1, 1. What's this going to give? Oh, let's see, it's 0 plus 1, 1 plus 1, and so we get 1, comma 2. Still haven't seen the identity element yet. Hmm. I know the answer to this one already. Why? Well, because I remember Lagrange's theorem. The order of any element in any group is a divisor of the number of elements in the group. The number of elements in this group is six. So the order of this element has to be a divisor of six. Well, the order isn't 2 because I didn't get the identity when I did the operation with itself twice. And the order's not 3 because I didn't get the identity element. So in fact, at this stage, I could have run immediately to the order is 6. But let's just go ahead and verify that our arithmetic is on target. 1, 1, which is 1 plus 1 inside Z2. 2 plus 1 inside Z3, which is 0 comma 0, which is the identity element. So that checks out. That's nice. So the order of that particular element is 6, or rephrased, if I list out all the things that appeared here, let's go ahead and do that. I got 0, 2. I got 1, 0. I got 0, 1. And I got 1, 2, which is all of the group, Z2 cross Z3, the whole thing. So there is at least one element inside this group with the property that when you look at it and all of its quote unquote powers, you actually get the whole group back. So the group is cyclic. So, so Z2 cross Z3 is cyclic. Proof, I mean the proof to show that something is cyclic is all you have to do is somehow come up with at least one element that generates it, and I've done that for you. Now it turns out there is one other element that, mm, yep, there's one other element that is also a generator of this group, but at least for the purposes of what we're trying to get across here, that's 
neither here nor there. There is at least one, and therefore it works. On the other hand, example, here's the group. G is Z2 cross Z2. Well, it's even easier to write out what the four elements of this group look like. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. That's what they look like as sets. That's no big deal. And what I'm about to convince you, hopefully, is that this group, it turns out, even though just like the example we did previously, is the direct product of two cyclic groups, that one turned out to be cyclic. This one will turn out to be not cyclic. Show something's not cyclic, just take everything in the group, look at the subgroup that they generate, and convince me that you never get the entire group. That's pretty easy to do. Look, if I look at the subgroup generated by, oh, folks, this is true in any group. The subgroup generated by the identity element is always just the identity element. Just keep beating on it. The subgroup generated by 1, 0, I mean, these will be pretty easy to see is, well, 0 is in there always by default. The element's in there by definition, and now if I combine this thing with itself, 1, 0 plus 1, 0, you get 2 comma 0. That's happening inside Z2. And so that's it. You get back to 0, 0. This has order 2. Similarly, 0, 1. You get just these two things, 0, 0, 0, 1. Just do the computation. Why? Because if you do this thing with itself, you get 0, 2 which is 0, 0. And then finally, if you take 1, 1, you get 0, 0, and you get itself. Now the difference here, and I think this is intuitively what I don't know makes it clearest, in this situation, if I take 1, 1 and I combine it with itself, I get 2, 2, which in this particular group is 0, 0. On the other hand, when I took what looks to be the same element over here and I combined it with itself, I didn't get 0, 0 because somehow there was, it sort of skewed off a little bit. It's not just, <coughs> excuse me, it's not just 2, comma 2, it's 2, comma 3. So you sort of miss, and then all right, so you keep going, and then, oh, you keep going to the point where, yeah, now things have worked out. So that you get a zero here, but by getting a zero here, you didn't get a zero here, and so you had, sort of had to keep going. So that when you finally saw zeros in both slots, it took you six whacks to get there. Whereas here, in order to get zero in both slots, it didn't take you four whacks. You, you wound up there after two steps. Hmm. So not cyclic. Not cyclic. Well, but it is abelian, so that's no big deal. So this turns out to be an abelian group. It's got four elements. It's got the property that each element, at least the element that's not the identity, if you take each element that's not the identity and you combine it with itself, you get the identity. And we've seen a group like that. What do we call it? V. Well, this is the group V. You take four elements, a billion, with the property that if you take any of the non-identity elements and you combine it with itself, you get back to the identity. And that's precisely what we call V. It had a different form as well. We also realized it as the collection of four matrices, each two by two with plus or minus one in the main diagonals. So this group now is sort of arising a little bit more naturally. So Z2 cross Z2 is isomorphic to V. So what we've just done is we've realized V in a relatively concrete way as the direct product or the Cartesian product of the group Z2 with itself. Not too bad. So let me go ahead and give you a homework assignment. Uh, it won't be due for another couple of weeks, but it's sort of the, the right rhythm to give you an assignment on Monday and let you start on it if you choose. Um, what we'll do after the exam next Monday is we'll continue looking at this question of when, when you have a, uh, a direct product of cyclic groups, when is the resulting direct product also cyclic? And can we say something about the structure of these things? So, 
let's see let me make sure I'm not doing the wrong thing yeah here is home and this is due not until October 10th because okay. the assignment that I gave you last Monday isn't due until October 3rd because of the exam in between this is in section 13 problems 1 through 16 28 to 32 and 47 to 51 and the ones I'm going to have you turn in are 6, 8, 29, 47 and one extra problem uh, prove yeah, if this is Greek letter phi from G to G prime is a, and this is a word that we didn't use tonight but we'll use next Monday after the exam homomorphism show and here's a notation that we haven't used yet but we'll use next Monday KER phi is the subgroup of G so that's a question that we have indeed asked before uh, and then I'll say, and I'll, I'll repeat these with the appropriate, now let me just do these. Um, on number eight, what do I want you to do? Oh yeah, add the following instruction. Uh, what property of the group G would ensure, ensure that B is a homomorphism. So that's an added piece on number eight. And on number 29, I want you to change the instructions slightly. 29 is phrased as, is it or is it not a homomorphism? It is. So I want you to prove that B sub G is a homomorphism. Okay. And again, we slightly touched on some of the ideas in some